Please welcome to the stage the great William Friedkin. Thanks, Chris. Hello there. Hello, sir. Good to see you. How are you, sir? I'm good. Good, good How evening. Are you? How are you? I think we're all good. Buying Fine. anything tonight? Any. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a trolley dash later on. You'll be running around. Oh, uh, cool. <laughs> it's, it's all good. Uh, you've been around the world with this film, and uh, festival after festival after festival, and uh, you've just been up in Edinburgh. How just was got it? in from Edinburgh about yeah. two hours ago. <laughs> How was the reaction up there? Fantastic. Yeah. Really great. And it's opening here um, across the UK on June 27th. 29th. Okay, yeah, next 29th. week. 29th? 29th, yeah. yeah. June 29th. 29th. So next week. So is it, is it a strange time as a filmmaker? You've been working on a film for a, a couple of years. Finally, it's ready to go out into the world. How, how do you feel at that point? Are you nervous about the reaction <laughs> no, you get? or never. Never? But, you know, by the time the film comes out, it's something that you have lived with for so long that you're sort of detached from it, you mm -hmm. know? Then it's out in the world and it belongs to the audience. Okay. And there's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> but while you're in the cutting room with it, it speaks to you. It's constantly saying to you, I am not this, yeah. I am that. So you, it changes a lot from what the script was, from what you shot, from the sequences you had planned. The film itself, over the years and the films I've done, they sort of have a life of their own. Mm, uh, well, absolutely. I mean, uh, and you've gone back a couple of times, speci you know, specifically, obviously, to the uh, the Exorcist, and changed things. So, do you see? So, do you tamper with your films? Do you still look at them and go again and again? Do you? Well, there's a a famous story that I love about the post-impressionist painter mm -hmm. Pierre Bonnard, and Bonnard's works were in the Louvre in his lifetime. And one day, he was a rather short gentleman. One day. He went into the Louvre with a palette and some brushes, and he started to touch up one of his paintings. <laughs> and the guards immediately jumped on him. And they said, what are you doing? They grabbed him, they shackled him, they took him off under arrest. He said, but I'm Bonnard, I'm the painter. I I'm the one who made this painting, and I'm fixing it. And the guards <laughs> said, Monsieur Bonnard, it's in the Louvre, it's finished. <laughs> It's finished, and I feel none of my works are in the Louvre, by the way. But I feel as he did. Yeah. I would, I would keep cutting this. I would keep remaking all of my films if I had the chance. Oh, really? They're never done in my mind. I heard a yeah. great saying once: films are never finished; they escape. That's true. That is quite true. Well, they, you know. The distributor has to have them at a certain point. They just seize them. Mm. You know, they, they're booked. Most films are booked before you finish them. Uh, this film is coming out for Christmas. <laughs> you, you might, uh, you know, not even have a first cut, but it's... Co when I did The Exorcist, the film was going to open on December 26th, the day after Christmas. Yeah. And... The final prints were delivered on Christmas Day, <laughs> you know, across the world. And I finished on Christmas Eve. It was literally what they call wet prints. Oh, yeah. I had nine editors in nine different rooms, and I would go from room to room to room because we only, we only had about a month to finish a two-hour film. Oh, my God. But with nine editors, you know, it moved... Well, maybe six times as fast. <laughs> Not all the editors were of the same speed. <laughs> I imagine the uh, Christmas dinner that day was was uh, was a, a great one for you, a great relief in a way, or did you just collapse into it? I actually don't remember. All I remember about where we cut this film, which was in New York, it was at the 666 Fifth Avenue building. That literally was... The home of Warner Brothers, yeah. 666 Fifth Avenue. That's where our editing rooms were during the time of The Exorcist. Wow. I think somebody caught on after that what 666 signified, and so they've changed the number. <laughs> Same building. 
Oh, uh, do any of the uh, the stories that have sprung up over the years, possibly apocryphal stories about the Exorcist, surprise you? You'd have to tell me what they are. <laughs> I'll tell you if they're apocryphal or not. Some of them, I'm sure, will be true. Well, some of the stories, for example, about uh, keeping the, the temperature on set very, very cold. Oh, yeah. Keeping the we, actors on their toes. We had the, in order to show breath on the screen, be, because of the, s the presence of the so-called demon, we had to show breath in this child's bedroom. And in the old days when Hollywood wanted to show breath like someone was um, uh, in a snow scene or they were, you know, in a horse and carriage going through the snow. It was done at a place called the Glendale Ice House where they made enormous chunks of ice mm. that they used to deliver to restaurants and they restaurants would chip off the, from a gigantic chips okay. these little ice as much as they needed. And by the time I got to The Exorcist, there was no longer, they didn't make ice like that anymore. And there was no more Glendale Ice House. So what we had, to, and we were in New York anyway, and Glendale's in California. What we had to do was we had to build the set inside of a refrigerated cocoon. So over the top of four walls of the set were air conditioners that would air condition the Wolseley restaurant or some, <laughs> or some gigantic building. We had four enormous air conditioners and every night when we'd finish shooting, we turned them on. And when we'd come to work in the morning, it was 30 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. Oh I don't know God. what that is, Cold. Celsius. I'm, I'm We're sort of ignorant of Celsius in the <laughs> United States. Well, we're the same for Fahrenheit, so it's okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, uh, but the minute the movie lights went on, we had maybe 40 minutes of shooting before the temperature rose. Right. We had to shut down during that sequence and build up the cold again, and we were able to make maybe three or four setups a day because of that in the exorcism sequence. Wow. And was there an element back then of trying to keep actors off balance and on their toes? Why, and sure. That anything you, could happen? You always like to keep actors off balance. Because, <laughs> no, film acting is extremely difficult, much yeah. more than stage acting. A stage performance, as you know, you, you go on, the curtain opens, you start, and you go through to the end. With a film, you shoot out of sequence. Not only that. Let's say as a director, you want an actor, let's say Chris over here, with a camera on him, you want him to look as though he's just seen the demon, okay? The, now the camera's over here, he's over there. What's out here is not a demon, it's the crew standing around, <laughs> scratching their stomach, having a cup you know, uh, reading the newspaper, some of them moving lights, and he's not at all looking at what he's supposed to be looking at. And roll it, action, so from a dead start, the actress or the actor has to create an emotion. Mm. And you have to help them to do that by, as you say, unsettling them. Absolutely. If that's the emotion. Even if it's an emotion such as you're looking at your loved one. Well, yeah. you're not looking at your loved one. You're looking at a 240-pound grip standing over there <laughs> eating a triple cheeseburger, you know. <laughs> Grips can be loved ones as well. Well, like they are just, loved. Just, <laughs> you know, everyone loves a grip. In fact, there's a T-shirt in America that says, get a grip on yourself. <laughs> but fast forward for, uh, 40 years to Killer Joe. That uh, wasn't a fast forward. <laughs> it was a slog, I'll tell you. But uh, are you the same director in a way? Do you like to unsettle the actors now? I just know a little more than I did. When I started out directing, I did the same thing that everyone did. I would shoot 20 or so or more takes of a scene, hoping for a miracle to happen on around take 18 or something. Nice. And I found when I got into the editing room that usually the take I went with was the first printed take. Because even though I might have printed 18 or so more, the first printed take had the spontaneity. Mm -hmm. And I found over the years 
that I'm more interested in spontaneity than perfection. Okay. So I don't do more than one or two takes now. That's one of the things I've learned. You get on the same page with the actors. The most important thing a film director does is choose the material that he or she wants to direct. And the next most important thing is the casting. And then what you're really doing as a director is providing an atmosphere where the technicians and the actors can do their best work. Absolutely. In order to do that with an actor or an actress, you have to get to know them pretty well. I have to know, let's say if I'm casting you, what it, we'll talk, we'll just sit around for quite a while days, maybe longer, okay. and I'll find out as much as I can about what makes you happy or sad or afraid or angry, and I will call upon that when it comes to a scene where you have to do that. Okay. In other words, I will know how to touch your sense memories, and that's what an actor works off of, especially in cinema sense memory, what you recall as a younger person or whatever that really made you very sad. And what the director does, it, it's kind of an evil profession <laughs> because what you will do is scratch that wound, you know? I mean, with Linda Blair in The Exorcist, she was a 12-year-old girl, and I used to say to her <laughs> before I'd ask her to do something, you know, you're not going to get your milkshake tonight. You, <laughs> you know, and she loved milkshakes. She thrived on them. And I would tell her, I don't know how many of you have seen The Exorcist. Have, you, have any of you seen The Exorcist? Oh, yeah. Lots and lots. If yeah. you haven't, get the hell out of here. <laughs> no, um, I would ask her to do some of the most outrageous, imaginable things. She was 12 years old. And I'd say, now, Linda, you have to do this. And she'd say, oh, no. No, I can't do that. And I said, oh, sure you can. <laughs> and no, no, I can't say that. And I, if you don't say that, Linda, you're not going to have your milkshake. Really? I, yes. So she'd do it. <laughs> you know, and that, that was her sense memory. You know? Uh, I, I did worse than that, I must say. <laughs> That's the only like, one I can clean up. So Yeah, before 9 o'clock, before, <laughs> before the watershed. Um, have you, this, this, this method of yours, we talk to uh, actors and get to know them a bit better, does that weed out the actors then who can't handle spontaneity, who have to work up to a take five, take six, take seven performance? I just don't work with, you know, the thing is, I've never auditioned an actor or an actress. I go on instinct. And if, let's say, they're physically right for the role, I mean, if, you know, a, a young uh, female uh, in her early 20s, whatever it is, uh, no, uh, ordinary looking or very attractive or whatever it is, I don't audition them. I'll just meet with several people. I'll talk to them. And, and the first thing... I try to establish is their intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I look for. In other words, do they understand the script that we're doing? Mm -hmm. Do they get it? And are we on the same page? You know, I've had actors say to me, uh, I see the character this way or that way, and if I see it in a completely different way, I'm not going to cast that actor. Because you have to be on the same page yeah. with the cast. Or there'll be constant strife on the set. Has that happened to you before? Uh, it has happened, yeah. Uh, and so you, you've got to get a good sense when you meet an actor. Like here, Roy Scheider in The French Connection. Yeah. I had never seen him act. He, in fact, he didn't have a film out. He was doing small off-Broadway theater. But the casting director brought him in to meet with me. And I knew immediately when he came into the room that he was the guy I wanted. He looked the part. He had the swagger. He had everything. And I remember saying to him, uh, so, Roy, uh, what are you doing now? He said, well, I'm in an off-Broadway play. I said, what is it? He said, well, it's a Jean Genet play. I think it was The Balcony. And I said, what part do you play? He said, well, I play a cigar-smoking nun. <laughs> 
I said, really? Yeah. I said, okay, you got the part. <laughs> so I'm serious. I'm not exaggerating. He, just in talking to him, I knew he was the guy. Yeah. You have an instinct. If you're going to direct something, you must trust your instinct. Anything that you're going to do creatively, a painting, uh, some, something you're writing, you must, first of all, believe in yourself and trust your instinct. Mm. That's, those are the only qualifications. That and ambition and luck mm -hmm. and the grace of God. And you, you notice I, I have not mentioned talent because there are many <laughs> talentless people making a fortune out there. But they have ambition and luck and the grace of God. Absolutely. So um, what did your instinct tell you about Matthew McConaughey for, the, for, this, for this role? Because people will say this is Matthew McConaughey as we've never seen him before, but he, he has tended towards the dark in films before. Well, Mo Matthew McConaughey's problem as an actor, he's a fine actor, but his problem has been that he's such a good-looking man. Yeah. And if you're a good-looking man or woman in Hollywood, they don't need you to act. You just have to show up. You just know, show up, take off your shirt, and, and play the love scene like you mean it. You know, look at the woman, the other woman, or the man, whatever it is, and play the love scene. So that's all he had to do. For yeah. He was making $10, $20 million a picture, just taking his shirt off. <laughs> but I knew that he comes from this part of the country where this film is set. He is what we call a, a Texas redneck from the Red River, mm. which is a really harsh environment. It's on the Texas-Oklahoma border. He comes from there, he knows these guys, he grew up with them, and he understands them. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to do this. Absolutely. So uh, I met with him, talked to him, got all the pressure points down, and uh, we did it. One, two, two. He's fabulous in the picture. If you've ever seen him in, in a soppy comedy, you know, making love to whoever, <laughs> uh, Sandra Bullock or somebody, this ain't that. <laughs> but he does take a shirt off. Uh, he there's, takes there's everything <laughs> off. And why not? I mean, we all do it at some point. Why shouldn't a, you know, if a guy's getting dressed to go to sleep, he takes his clothes off or oh. getting up. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, don't you? I, well, occasionally, occasionally. So you're naked I, I'm, I'm very British. often. I'm, well, I'm British, so I try not to be. No sex, please. <laughs> absolutely. Right. I do try. <laughs> Where does that come from? No sex, please. We're British. It's just a national condition, I think. Ah, as I know, it's the title of a play. You it guys is, yeah. Are, yeah. But why? Uh, it's just it's a very, very sensitive subject. We don't like to talk about it. Really? Okay. We're not here to talk about us. <clears throat> anyway. Shall we, uh, shall we have a look at a clip? He said, desperately trying to segue into this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we ha this isn't the clip where we meet Killer Joe, but this is a clip where, we, uh, where people talk about him. This is the one with the Emil okay. Hirsch and Thomas Hayden Church in a strip joint. So, roll the clip. You don't have to applaud. That's I'll so applaud. disjointed. <laughs> So that's a uh, Emil Hirsch and that's uh, Thomas the Hayden Church. That's yeah. the setup. And, and their father and son. Father and son, absolutely. And they're talking about killing the ex-wife mm -hmm. and mother of the young boy and his sister. Absolutely. And this is a, this is a, originally a play by uh, Tracy Letts, who also wrote Bug, which was your last mm -hmm. film, which was based again on his play. Um, so, at which point did this come into your life? Were you aware of Killer Joe when you were doing Bug, or? I was aware of it, but he sent me a screenplay. He okay. had completely rewritten it as a movie mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years ago and, and sent it to me and said, why don't you read this and see if you'd like to do it as a film? Mm -hmm. okay. And I thought it was brilliant. And which way did he open it up from the, uh, from the play? Many ways. It's, yeah. it's a film. In the same way, I mean, many of you may not be aware of it, but like a film you may have heard of called Casablanca. <laughs> it's considered one of the great films ever made, certainly in the States. That was a play. You don't think of it today as a play. You think of it as a movie. But it's all set in one place. Yeah. Rick's Cafe Americaine. There's only a few 
exteriors, but they're all shot on a sound stage, and it's shot all around this nightclub that Bogart owns. Mm -hmm. There's a flashback scene in Paris that's done in front of rear screen projection. Right. Yeah. It was a play called Everyone Comes to Rick's. Mm -hmm. Never was produced, but what they shot was the play. And now no one thinks that, that, that its origins uh, as a play had anything to do with this film, but the play is the film. It's a great movie. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Another one called A Few Good Men absolutely, was yeah. a play. And then uh, some uh, Hollywood films that won the Academy Award as, as best film were plays. Sound of Music, Cabaret, My Fair Lady. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these and many, many more. A film like The Letter mm -hmm. with Betty Davis. Uh, all plays. Films come from many sources, from real life, from the newspapers, from novels, some of them. The earliest films all came from plays. There were no screenwriters when they started making movies. There were stage writers. Mm -hmm. And they adapted their plays even in the silence until the silence evolved into a purely visual medium with people like Buster Keaton and Chaplin. Mm, absolutely. And then after, when sound came in, mostly plays. Mm. But uh, Bug, in particular, was a very confined piece. Most of my films are yeah. claustrophobic and confined, even the ones that are shot outdoors. They're all about desperate people with very few alternatives, mm. and they're all sort of locked up inside themselves for some reason. So even films that are opened up quite a bit, like, you know, The French Connection, which is... Shot, no sets, all actual locations all over the city of New York and all the boroughs. It's still a claustrophobic film. Absolutely. Or something like even The Haunted or To Live and Die in L.A. I yeah. Yeah, same thing. But, um, and they weren't plays. No, ab absolutely not. Um, this is your second time in a, in a row, then, with uh, Tracy Letts. What's it about working with Tracy Letts? Well, we have the same worldview. We mm. see the world in the same way. As, and we see a lot of what goes on as either very disturbing or absurd. And w we see that in everyone, everyone sitting in this space and outside and outside this city and this country and everywhere, every one of us is capable of good and evil. We mm. all have it within ourselves. And I believe there's a very thin line between good and evil. And it's a constant struggle for our better angels to thrive over our demons. And that's the subject that draws Tracy Letts and I, that yeah. thin line between good and evil that's in everyone. Yeah. You see it all the time everywhere. You know, some guy living next door, he seems like a quiet chap. He's got a wife and family, whatever, goes to work every day, comes home, the neighbors think he's fine. You find out he's got 11 bodies buried in the cellar. Yeah. You know, th 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 it's very strange what makes people snap, but it's there in all of us. I mean, I have had, at various points in my life, the impulse to kill somebody. <laughs> really. I mean, I remember when I was 13 years old, and after school, there was this fellow who was older than me, his name was Joel Fenster. And he used to bully me around, you know? He used to grab my school books and throw them away, and he'd push me around. And, you know, this went on for a very long time, possibly a year or so. Okay. And one day, you know, I was at home, and I was thinking about this as I was getting older, and I thought, you know, I don't have to take this anymore. What the hell am I letting this guy do this for? And when he came over to do it to me, I put him in a headlock. I had been watching wrestling on TV. <laughs> I put him in a headlock and banged his head on the sidewalk. And I kept banging it. And I remember I was 13 years old. I had the impulse to kill him. Hmm. And I remember thinking as I was doing it, I would feel a lot better if this guy was dead. 
And I don't know what it was that prevented me from killing him, because mm. I certainly wanted to. So when I've had people portray that in a film, it doesn't come from outside my own experience. Absolutely, because the, the violence in this, in this movie is unflinching and very, very raw. And in the States... Well, I've seen that. So. Well, yeah, absolutely. But in the States, it got a, an NC-17 yeah. certificate, which is vaguely preposterous. If you don't know what an NC-17 certificate is... If you don't know what an NC-17 is, get the hell out <laughs> of it. Uh, it effectively means that uh, it, it rules out most people going to see your film, doesn't it? it no, means, an uh, NC-17... Forgive me, Chris. Yeah. You've no, got no, a great but magazine, but... Oh, well, thank you. It lit... <laughs> It literally stands for no child under 17, 17. under se permitted, not even with a parent. Means you as a parent don't, can't make that decision. Now, we're not targeting young people under 17. We, mm. we, we really don't want them in the theater. But it's up to a parent to make that decision. The ratings board, to me, is a hoax. They, don't, they have no legal standing. You know, they're a self-governing body of the Motion Picture yeah. Association of America. They're, they have no written rules whatsoever, no standards that you can look at. We don't know who they are. They're anonymous. We don't know how they got on the ratings board. We don't know their names. I, if you have a son or daughter at school, presumably you know who their teachers are hmm. or who their, even the principal might be. And if... You know who the mayor of your town is, and you possibly even know the name of the prime minister. <laughs> but So you know who's governing you and who's telling you what you can do and not do. And if you don't like it, you know where to go to complain. And uh, if they're up for re-election, you can vote them out of office. With the ratings board... These are an anonymous group of people sitting in a dark room mm. making completely subjective decisions. Having said that, I think the rating for this film is correct. I, I, I am not uh, targeting children under 17. But when I used to work for an improvisational theater company in uh, Chicago called The Second City... Oh, yeah. uh, a lot of great comedians came out of the sec improvisation. There was an improvisational company here at the time called the Establishment that did the same thing, and we used to we had this one sketch that Second City did: four people sitting in chairs like this on a stage, and uh, the light supposedly from a movie projector shining on them, and they're going. They're supposedly watching a film. And they're the ratings board. And they're going, oh, my. Oh, no. Oh, dear. Oh. Oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> Isn't that? Oh, look at that. And then the lights come up and they say, oh, we can't let people see that. <laughs> oh, no, we can never show, let them show that. And that's what it is. They yeah. sit around like wankers. And, <laughs> and then they say, we can't show that. We can't let people see that. I talked. I met this young guy, J.J. Abrams. You probably yeah. know his name. He yeah. created the TV show Lost. He did a Star Trek. He told me he had his father took him to see The Exorcist when he was seven years old. Yeah. And it certainly didn't ruin his life. You know? <laughs> no, he, he's done okay. So you haven't met anyone from the MPAA? You haven't I don't know who the hell they are. Like, yeah. They no, might be no in headlocks. this room, for all I know. <laughs> you know, they might be on holiday. They might be at, at the Wolves. I don't know who they are. No one knows who they are. Well, there's some people who know who they are. Their own families. and the, the Maybe, maybe. The fellows who appointed them. And we don't know how they get appointed. Is it political? What is it? What qualifies? Do, does anyone here feel qualified to pass a judgment on what, sh you know, maybe you do. But I remember there was a, an associate justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Mm. And his name was Potter Stewart. And he was, they were confronted with a pornography case. One of the first... Uh, pornography cases that the Supreme Court of the United States had listened to. And I remember Potter Stewart's comment that he gave on an interview after he had retired from the court. He said, you know, 
we had this case, and I can't actually define pornography, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> and that's how the ratings board feels. They know it yeah. when they see it. But you will, you will never see a major studio, a member of the Motion Picture Association of America, get an NC-17 rating. Mm. They will go in and they will make a few odd trims here and there as a kind of gesture to Her Majesty, the ratings <laughs> board. You know, they'll cut 18 frames or 19 frames or a few, and the ratings board will feel like they've done their job in protecting an unsuspecting uh, group of young people from mm. seeing the film, and they give it an R. And I wasn't prepared to do that. I'm just too old to <laughs> bow down and let them give me the chop, you know? Quite it's right. like what many of the American generals said in explaining why we went to Vietnam. They said, well, we had to go and destroy the country in order to save it. <laughs> and that's exactly what I would have had to do with this film. Yeah. Destroy it in order to save it. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's have a, a second clip now from this shocking NC-17 film. Uh, this is where we actually get to meet Killer Joe, along with Dottie, who's played by Juno Temple, who's a fantastic British actress, and she's the uh, sister of Emile Hirsch's Chris. Uh, roll a clip, please. Fantastic. No applause, please. We're British. Yeah. Just remember, just remember that. Uh, okay, so let's have some questions from you guys now. We've got some roving microphones going around. Uh, put your hands up if you have a question for uh, William. And uh, yes, just wait for the microphone, sir. Yes, sir. Hello, great to see you. Um, My pleasure. You've talked about a lot of the interesting actors you've directed over the years, but I'd like to ask about one in particular. Um, you're the only American to have directed Norman Wisdom in The Night They Raided <laughs> Minsky's. So I'd like to ask what that was like having a very British comedian in an American film. Does everyone remember Norman Wisdom or some oh, yeah. of you? Oh, yeah. He was on TV a lot here, I guess. He, I had seen him in a play on Broadway. I needed a, a music hall character. And he happened to be on Broadway at the time in a musical called Walking Happy. And he was just marvelous. And then I, uh, I'd never seen any of the films he made over here. He made a whole series of B pictures over here or even C pictures. But it turned out that he was one of Charles Chaplin's favorite comedians. And he was, I thought, marvelous. And I cast him having seen him on the stage, met with him afterwards. By the time I cast him, I knew he could do anything that that part called for. Fantastic. Were you surprised he didn't get any American roles after that? No, because, uh, you know, uh, at that time, there weren't a lot of American roles casting British actors yeah. or actors. The, the odd one or two, you know, I mean, Michael Caine. Mm. Uh, and mostly in dramas, Peter Sellers, you know. But Norman Wisdom did come back here and made more films in the UK and then did some television and Absolutely. Absolutely. had a long career. Uh, okay, so who's next? There's a gentleman right at the back, if you can just keep your hand up so we can see you. Hi. Yes, sir. Hi. Hello. Um, well, this film, I mean, even before its general release in this country, is, is already received quite a bit of notoriety because of a you know a specific scene involving fried chicken as has been mentioned and I mean this kind of notoriety isn't necessarily new to you or your films when you're creating a moment like that in a film is that notoriety and boundary pushing something that you're very conscious of or does it just happen naturally I thought the scene was unusual <laughs> when, when I read it in the script I mean it wasn't you know, like two people sitting at a, at a calf, you know, having a, a cuppa. You know, it was an unusual scene. Whether it would have caused notoriety or not, no, I don't think about that. I didn't think about it in The Exorcist. Afterwards, when it happens, I'm, I'm pretty much surprised because I usually begin to feel that the audience can deal with almost anything that I present to them. They'll like it or not like it, but I don't uh, do it to disturb them. You know, it's part of the actions of these characters. And they come alive to you. The characters speak to you. And uh, 
when a scene like the one you're referring to takes place, it just evolves as part of the story. In the case of what you're talking about, it's a vengeance and humiliation scene. And uh, there are a lot of people that find it disturbing. A lot of people find it quite funny. And a lot, I did a radio interview with a wonderful woman over at the BBC, and she had just come from seeing the film, and she was a bit like that. You know, and uh, so, but what I found over the years is most of you, what you bring to a film is what you take away from it. Mm. Very few of you are going to have your mind changed by a, by a film. Very few. If you, for example, think that the world is a dark and evil place where the devil prevails, you can take that from The Exorcist. But if you feel, as I do, that there is also a force for good that offsets that evil force and sometimes, not always, but sometimes even triumphs over it, you can take that from The Exorcist. And that's what I found in, in all of my films. People usually take from them what they bring to it. We obviously don't want to spoil the scene in question. No, no. But uh, was it a one-take deal? Everything's one take. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's no need for take two. You, you know, unless you own stock in Eastman Kodak or something, <laughs> which I didn't happen to. And I'm glad because they're bankrupt now <laughs> and they're not making any more film. Oh, yeah, Sad to say. Uh, Everything will be digital from this point on. Are we Indeed. done? I think we're done. On that note, thanks for coming, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. William Freakin. Thanks very much.